Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pediatrics, and to be more specific, I'm going to be going over Kawasaki disease. So before we get started, guys, please support my channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so go ahead, press that like button now. Subscribe to my channel if you have done so already, and don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, let's get into it, guys. So Kawasaki disease, this is a disorder, guys where the patient has inflammation of the vessels all over the body. This is something that's systemic and we have no idea why this is happening. So let's take a look. Um, I never have a pen. I always want a pen or something to point with and I never have one. So, all right, look at what it says. It says Kawasaki disease. This is an acute, so it happens like that, right? It's acute systemic vasculitis of unknown cause. We have no idea what causes it. The etiology, unknown, okay? The peak incidence is in, um, excuse me, the peak incidence is in the toddler age group. This disease is self-limiting. However, even though it's self-limiting, guys, if it's not um, detected soon enough and it's not treated, it can have some lifelong effects. So let's take a look. Uh, it says that self-limited, however, without treatment, about 20 to 25% of children develop coronary artery dilation or aneurysm formation. Imagine being a child or a teenager with aneurysms. These patients are at risk for what? Strokes, myocardial infarctions, right? So we want to make sure we detect it early and we treat it early. Again, the etiology is unknown. Let's look at the patho. It says the principal area of concern in Kawasaki disease is the care. I can't speak. Is the cardiovascular system. So during the initial stage of illness, extensive inflammation. Remember the whole, the whole point of this whole disease process is what inflammation throughout all of the vessels. So there's extensive inflammation of the arterioles, the venules, and capillaries. Systemic widespread inflammation of the vessels. Let's keep going. Death is very rare. And even though it's rare, guys, remember I said there can be some chronic long-term effects. So death is very rare and is usually the result. So if that patient does end up dying, the reason they die is from, look at this, myocardial ischemia from coronary thrombosis during the first few months of illness or years later from severe scar formation because what happens scar tissue as the tissue tries to heal scar tissue grows excuse me the scar tissue stretch no right so scar formation and stenosis that's hardening of the coronary aneurysms so let me make sure you guys understand an aneurysm guys is a weakness of a vessel. So let's talk about what's going on with this patient. There's widespread inflammation of those vessels. That widespread inflammation of vessels cause what? Weakness, aneurysms. Aneurysms already puts you at risk for strokes, already puts you at risk for possible myocardial infarctions, right? So what they're also saying is even though the patient may not die, actually death is rare. However, if they do die, most likely they're dying as a result of that myocardial ischemia from the thrombosis for formation or stenosis. Stenosis means hardening, hardening of... Um, uh, those uh, vessels from that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's here by scar formation. I can't think. Okay. That's important for you to know. Let's look at the clinical manifestations. How can we figure out, even suspect, okay, this patient has a Kawasaki versus something else. Before we look at anything else, I'm telling you right now, fever, fever that is persistent. Whenever you're studying and you see that word persistent, what that tells you is that the patient has something despite you doing or you doing an intervention that evidence-based practice has shown us should make it get better. So if patient has a fever, right? Evidence-based practice has shown us if the patient has a fever, if we give them an antipyretic, that fever should go down, right? So the patient will have a fever and it's persistent because despite the nursing interventions or the medical interventions that have done for this fever, it's not going away. Let's take a look. 
It says the diagnosis is established based on clinical findings and associated associated a lab results. So before we go any further, let's take a look at this, the diagnostic criteria for Kawasaki. What does this patient have to have in order to be diagnosed? Classic Kawasaki disease criteria includes fever for five calendar days plus four out of the five clinical criteria. So they have to have fever. They have to have a fever for how many clinical days? Five. And on top of that fever for five days, they have to have four out of five of this list. What are the, um, um, this is a list of five, but they have to have at least four plus that fever for five days. So let's take a look. Changes in the extremities. What are the changes? In the acute phase, they're going to have edema or erythema of the palms and soles. In the subacute phase, they may have periangular disquamation. That's peeling of the hands and feet. Now, important something important to know about that peeling, it's not painful. It doesn't hurt when we see the palms of their hands or the soles of their feet when it peels. However, when the skin grows back, it may be tender, okay? Number two, bilateral conjunctival injection, inflammation without exudation. Three, changes in the oral mucous membranes, like what? Erythema, that redness, cracking of the lips, or pharyngeal reddening. Oh, <gasps> strawberry tongue. I don't even know how I didn't have that underlined and I don't even have a pen or highlighter, but make sure you know that one. Strawberry tongue. Rash, macropapular diffuse um, erythroderma or erythema multiform like. And number five, cervical lymphadenopathy. Typically, it's going to be unilateral. That means one side is going to be unilateral more than 1.5 centimeters. So the patient has to have a fever consecutively for five calendar days plus four out of five of these that have just been listed. Make sure you know the diagnostic criteria for Kawasaki disease. All right, let's keep going. So where did I stop? I stopped here. So it says the patient's going to have a high fever that is unresponsive to antibiotics and antipyretics. There goes that. So what they're saying right here is that P word that I was saying to you, persistent. The patient's having a fever despite us performing these nursing interventions, giving the antibiotics as ordered, giving the antipyretics as ordered, and the fever is not going away. Okay. Child is going to be typically irritable. And this irritability, guys, this is like a hallmark of Kawasaki disease. And this is important. You're going to have to teach the because the parents are going to get very annoyed very quickly. And you're going to have to teach them that um, this irritability that the child has is a hallmark um, uh, manifestation of Kawasaki's disease and it will pass. You have to teach that to the parents or they're going to freak out. Let's keep going. We're going to see elevated uh, WBCs, elevated liver function tests, elevated markers of inflammation. By the way, by now, I hope you know those markers of inflammation. When you see that ESR is increased, you see the CR CRPs increased. That lets you know the patient's got inflammation somewhere in the body. And in Kawasaki's, we know it's all over. All of those vessels are inflamed. Coronary artery aneurysms, remember aneurysm, that's the weakness of the vessels. Coronary artery aneurysms may become evident and previously dilated vessels may continue to increase in size. So those vessels are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What do you think could possibly happen? All right, let's take a look at the cardiac involvement. Long-term complications of Kawasaki disease include the development of coronary artery aneurysms. How many times have we seen that A word aneurysm, right? Potentially disrupting blood flow to the heart. Affected coronary arteries may dilate progressively. Progressively means um, as time goes on, it gets worse, okay? So affected coronary arteries may dilate progressively over initial few weeks of illness, reaching the maximal diameter of approximately four to six weeks from the onset of the fever. Now imagine this happening and happening and happening. Over the years, as the damaged vessel tries to heal, remember I talked to you about healing, that's where start, the, the scar tissue comes in, right? So after um, years and um, the damaged tissue tries to heal, we see stenosis. That's hardening of the aneurysm. And what can that lead to? My myocardial ischemia. All right, let's keep going. What's the diagnostic test? Echoes. 
Echocardiograms are used to assess coronary artery dilation. Therapeutic management. High dose IVIG, IV immunoglobin. Okay, they're going to get high dose IVIG along with salicylate therapy. Remember, we also need to get what? That temp down. Let's keep going. <gasps> aspirin, Professor D, we're in peds. We never give aspirin um, to children. Yes, we do. Not often, but we do sometimes. And Kawasaki disease is one of them. I've talked about this in um, one of my other peds videos. You need to know that. Aspirin has been used historically to control fever and symptoms of inflammation. And by the way, that salicylate, it also will help bring down that inflammation as well. Okay. So Kawasaki's is one of those disorders that we're going to give um, aspirin for. Now, of course, we're going to make sure that the patient doesn't have a viral illness such as, you know, um, varicella. They don't have chicken pox because we don't want, want them to have Rye syndrome. But at the end of the day, think about the alternative. So aspirin is going to be one of the medications we're going to give for Kawasaki disease. If the child develops coronary abnormalities, salicylate therapy is continued <gasps> indefinitely. What does that mean indefinitely? Forever and ever and ever and ever. There will be no end date, okay? What else can we give to treat this? Anti-thrombotic medications, because remember, thrombosis absolutely is a potential risk and complication. We don't want that patient to have a stroke. So examples, they may get, you know, Plavix, Coumadin, Lovenox. Prognosis. Most children with Kawasaki disease recover fully after treatment. And the key, guys, this is the key. Early de detectment. Is that word? Early detectment? No. Early detect. You know what I mean? Somebody tell me in the comment section what I'm trying to say. Early De early detecting, it's on the tip of my tongue, but detecting it early. How about that? Detecting it early. That is a key in early treatment, those two, okay? So look at out, um, quality patient outcomes, early diagnosis and treatment and prevention of cardiac complications, such as what? Myocardial infarction, uh, stroke. Nursing care management, you're going to do INOs, you're going to do daily weights, be careful giving fluids, we want the patient to be hydrated, but we don't want to overhydrate them, because when it comes to Kawasaki, one of the complications we may see is myocarditis, okay? We're going to assess that patient frequently for signs of heart failure. This includes decreased urinary output, gallop rhythm, tachycardia, respiratory distress. We're going to be looking out for all of these. And if we note them, we're going to notify the healthcare provider. Administration of IVIG should follow the same guidelines as for any blood product with frequent monitoring of vital signs. We're going to assess their cardiac status. We're going to minimize skin discomfort. We may apply cool cloth, unscented lotions. We don't want anything to irritate the skin. Uh, soft, loose clothing are helpful. During the acute phase, mouth care, including lubricating ointment to the lips, is important for mucosal inflammation because remember, they can have that redness and um, uh, inflammation in their mouth and around the lips. Clear liquids and soft foods can be offered. Okay, let's keep going. Patient irritability and mood swings are pervasive in Kawasaki disease. During hospitalization, these children need a quiet environment and they need rest, lots of rest. So you have to make sure you have them in a quiet place where they can get rest, not right next to the nurse's station where the phones are going off, the nurses are giving report, you know, they're dealing with family members. Uh-uh, you want to have them down the hall, preferably in a room by themselves where they can get rest and it's quiet have dim lighting. Parents need to understand that irritability is a what? Hallmark. It is a hallmark of Kawasaki disease. And you have to teach them that it's not going to last forever. Just hold on there. It will resolve. Discharge teaching. Okay. 
if you guys are wondering what just happened, they shut the lights off on me. As you know, my son's in soccer and I have to get these videos in some way. So I'm sneaking in one of the rooms making this video. And I guess it caught me, but until somebody comes in and tells me to leave, I'm going to keep going. All right, discharge teaching. Irritability may persist for up to two months after the onset of symptoms. Remember, irritability is what? A hallmark, but it will go away. Perianguinal desquamation, that's peeling of the hands and feet, begins in the second and third weeks. Usually the fingertips peel first, followed by the toes and feet. The peeling is painless. It does not hurt, but the new skin may be tender. Affected children are typically most stiff in the morning during cold weather and after a nap. So you want to do passive range of motion exercises, preferably in the tub, in the, excuse me, bathtub. That's helpful, helps with their flexibility. Any live vaccines, and they give you examples. I keep telling you guys when you're studying and you see them give you examples, especially in parentheses with a whole bunch of stuff with commas, those make beautiful select all that applies. Don't say I didn't warn you. Any live immunization such as measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, any live vaccines, they need to be deferred for 11 months after administration of the intravenous immunoglobin because the body might not produce the appropriate amount of antibodies to provide lifelong immunity. Think about it, guys. When we're giving a patient a live vaccine, we're giving it to them so that their body can naturally make these um, antibodies. Well, guess what? If that patient just got IVIG, you think they're going to be able to, to make sufficient antibodies? Uh-uh. Not enough to provide lifelong immunity. So that's why we're going to hold off 11 months from the time that they get that IVIG, okay? You're going to take daily temperatures. You're going to make sure you teach the patient you teach the family members, especially the parents, CPR. This is a cardiovascular disorder. Long-term follow-up. Again, this is a cardiovascular disorder. So everything you would do for those cardiovascular disorders, you're going to do this for the patient, even though this is a pediatric patient. So you're going to make sure that that patient gets their cholesterol screened every year at least yearly, if not every six months, right? You're going to be checking that blood pressure. You're going to make sure that they have a heart healthy diet. You teach your parents about the heart healthy diet, teach them about exercise, teaching about <gasps> avoidance of smoking. You know, smoking causes, I mean, it causes a million horrible things, but included in that is what? Vasoconstriction and vasospasm. Do you think this type of patient can afford to have that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So not only do, uh, obviously they should never smoke. They should stay away from anyone that does smoke. They should stay away from that smell. Okay. And that is your Kawasaki disease. In a nutshell, guys, that is Kawasaki disease. Please let me know what you thought about this video uh, in the comment section. Let me know if there's anything that you'd like to see me cover that I haven't done so already. I was really hoping because there's something else I want to cover with you, um, anaphylaxis, and I was hoping I'd be able to do it today, but these people about to boot me out. So I'm just happy I got done with this video. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.